and then uh, we are going to move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Raycan McDonald. Um, on Twitter, she's Schmeikan M. I love that handle. <laughs> Sounds cool. And Raycan is the European Policy Manager at Access. And Access is an international non-profit, non-governmental organization that defends and extends digital rights. Uh, Raycan is originally from Canada, and now she's based in Brussels, Belgium and she specializes in European policy with a focus on privacy, data protection, and network neutrality. And she has recently been recognized by Ontario's Information and Privacy Commissioner as a Privacy by Design Ambassador. That's awesome. Thank you, Thank you and welcome, um, Reikan. didn't manage to get slides today because I have the privilege of being in San Francisco this week because Access was launching, or we had a conference uh, that some of you might have already attended called RightsCon Silicon Valley. Um, so I've been very happy to be in this beautiful city and Berkeley as well. This is my first time here. And thank you again for the organizers. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about surveillance, um, well first, Access is an international organization and a little bit about us. We were founded in 2009 during the <coughs> Iranian revolution and basically it was a small team of technologists that had provided uh, support to the activists on the ground that were protesting there um, to give them access to the internet and to circumvent these blocks um, that the government had instituted on citizens um, that were attempting to use social media and, and the internet to associate. And that was really one of the first times that we saw most publicly this dichotomy between um, the internet and, and what social media in particular um, has given us. On the one hand, it allows us to connect with one another uh, very easily, uh, but then on the other, we've also seen that governments have been keen to use this, uh, the, use this technology against us. Um, so after 2009, Access expanded and added um, a policy element to, on the one hand, um, continue with the tech work uh, to give direct support to activists, um, on the ground activists, civil society, that are um, unfortunately under consistent attack, normally from their own governments. Um, but then also on the policy front to um, really change the norms and the laws and policies regarding uh, technology to make it, to bring them more in line with um, international human rights standards. So I'm in the Brussels office, but we also have offices in DC and New York, um, in Santiago, in Tunis, in Costa Rica, and soon in Manila, in the Philippines. Um, but so today I want to talk about um, how technology has changed the way surveillance is undertaken, uh, and then touch a little bit on why we have gotten to that point. Um, the result of what we're left with, which is essentially bad policy making around surveillance. Um, and then I want to touch on uh, potential solutions, and I will try to stay within my <laughs> 10 minute limit. Um, so technology has really changed the surveillance landscape, and especially for law enforcement authorities. And there are three main differences now that the ubiquity of technology has enabled. Uh, and this is especially due to the fact that information collection has become so cheap and so easy. Um, and so now policing is proactive, it's preventative, and retroactive. And so the proactive part is this mentality of collecting first and asking questions later. Um, and a perfect example of this before the, the revelations in 2006, there was a um, directive that was passed in the EU called the Data Retention Directive, which mandates the mass collection and storage of all telecommunications data. Um, and it's collected basically from six months to two years, depending on the member state. Uh, and this is, in effect, suspicionless surveillance. This is um, really threatens the backbone of our democratic societies because it removes this presumption of innocence. Where in a dem democratic society, we are innocent until proven guilty through a court of law. 
But when we're having all of our communications collected in the case that we might commit a crime at some point, um, changes this dynamic. Um, and the other element on preventive policing. Um, when you can combine these different types of surveillance. So there's communications surveillance. We know that metadata has become the new gold of, of law enforcement because it does reveal a ton about us. But then also combining it with drones, with um, CCTV cameras, facial recognition, um, all of these put together uh, is intended to help law enforcement actually prevent crimes before they even happen. Um, and in the EU, there are a number of research projects underway right now. You might have heard of INDECT, um, which are intending to do exactly this. Combine all of these surveillance methods, put them into one uh, place, uh, and then they feel that they will be able to prevent crimes before they happen. And this is treating us essentially like pre-criminals. Um, and then the second, or the third part is that it's retroactive policing. So when everything about us essentially is being collected and stored for who knows how long, um, this can be used against us in ways that we wouldn't have known um, at, in the beginning. So um, data essentially is meaningless until you put meaning to it. And in order to put meaning to it, you have to mine it. You have to apply algorithms uh, and analysis. Um, and this really results in the long term in, um, in the possibility of um, making a kind of data distortion. So you can tell a story that you want if you have a whole bunch of data. And there's a kind of classic story in Canada, maybe not here, of a Canadian scholar who is now in his late 60s. And he was trying to get into the United States. Uh, and somehow the border authorities got a hold of one of his papers that he wrote about experimenting with acid in the 60s. Uh, and they have banned him from <laughs> entering the United States because um, I guess he's a threat. So it just is an example that shows you that if you have such a vast um, amount of information that you can pick and choose from, this can result in, uh, in very serious discrimination. That's a risk for individuals. Um, and how did we get to this point? Um, one of the mentalities that has been uh, put into the public consciousness especially after 9-11, has been on this false dichotomy between privacy versus security, where you have to sacrifice one in order to have the other. And those who would infringe on our privacy argue that this is a necessary trade-off to protect it. But this supposed balance between privacy and security, where we have to sacrifice one for the other, is false. So when privacy and security are pitted against one another, we actually are in a lose-lose situation where we don't have either privacy or security. Um, and this has become quite obvious in the wake of the Snowden disclosures, um, where we, we know that the US intelligence services have been uh, weakening encryption uh, standards, making us much more vulnerable to not only government surveillance, but also um, third-party access. Um, and the RSA scandal is also instructive, um, where the NSA had paid or basically bribed um, them to, with $10 million to build um, security software with backdoors built in them. Um, so this actually leaves us with neither privacy or security, so trading anything is, uh, is not going to result in in a, in a win. Um, so I got. Um, so the, basically, the result is very bad policy making. If we have a mentality where we're in a sense where we have to trade off uh, privacy or other liberties in order to get security, this enables a lot of unanswered questions to go to rest. Um, and so what we have with this data retention directive that I mentioned, um, there's very bad laws that are passed with very little public discourse um, and very little research on the actual effectiveness of these technologies. So the previous panelists had discussed um, some of these, these um, surveillance, the, the prevalence of CCTV cameras essentially 
um, there is a certain technological positivism around the fact of, hey, if we just put cameras here, this will reduce crime. Uh, and there is very little actual credible demonstration of the fact that this is the case, um, and very little understanding of what the long-term impacts are, not only from a civil liberties perspective, but also on our communities at large. Um, and so, in terms of solutions, we, we can move this to the, to the panel discussion. I look forward to, to discussing this. But one of the main things we need is, and now that we have the Snowden revelations, we have an opportunity to really bring this discussion to the forefront and to demand um, you know, healthy public discourse, um, research, uh, fact-based policymaking, demonstrations of effectiveness, and clear, um, clear problems that surveillance is trying to solve before rolling it out and seeing what happens. Um, and, but also on the corporate end, it's important for corporations to, um, that do collect mass amounts of data that we know <coughs> governments have access to, to, um, to secure the data that they have. Um, we launched a campaign called encryptallthethings.net, which helps companies secure the data, but we also want them to collect fewer things. So practice good data hygiene in terms of data minimization. Um, and then the final point would be for us to use privacy enhancing technologies to make encryption more widespread, to use privacy enhancing um, services to reduce the data that we are emanating at all times um, to reduce the risks associated with, with surveillance. And I think my, my colleague Michael, who is also at Access from the tech team, will explore a little more on, on this, side of, this side of the coin. And that's it. Thank you.